You're listening to That Gets My Goat on the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Hello and welcome, everybody, to another episode of That Gets My Goat here on the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Big Anklevich. Greetings, spider friends. This is Rish Outfield, bringing you another thrilling tale of goats and spider-men. Does Spider-Man have anybody in his rogues gallery that has anything to do with goats? Uh, I mean, he's got a guy named Paint Pot Pete, so... What's, what's the name of the goat with a thousand young from the Cthulhu mythos? <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I could never get through those Cthulhu books. They always put me to sleep rather than scared me. Oh, that's cool. It's that old-timey language, you know? Yog sagoth will be disappointed to hear that. <laughs> no, I, not, I, I don't know of any goat-related spider villains. But, uh, the goat-footed balloon man that whistles far and wee is not one of Spider-Man's villains? I don't know that that's anybody's villain, man. What, what is that? <laughs> it's from a poem. The, I think it's called The Balloon Man. But it's a... Uh, balloon Man! Shoot, I can't remember. It's from a, uh, a class I had in college. I'm trying to remember the author, but I can't. It's not coming to me. Sorry. Tangent, or whatever we want to call it. Stock said you wouldn't get that, because it wasn't a Star Wars reference. That's right. All right, so today we are talking Spider-Man. Hence the Stan Lee intro. We were all introduced to... St- Dan Lee and Spider-Man at the same time with Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Do you remember that episode of, was it Ultimate Spider-Man? There's one of those Spider-Man cartoons not too long ago where he leaves New York and goes to Boston. And the episode was called Spider-Man with an H instead of an R because all the Bostonians using their accent called him, Hey, Spider-Man. Oh, we love you, Spider-Man. And he was so happy to go to Boston because people were actually nice to him for the first time ever. They appreciated him instead of it being J. Jonah Jameson. Oh, spoiler alert! Well, yeah, there will be spoilers in this episode, kids. But uh, you should see Spider-Man anyway. So, you know, even if there weren't spoilers, go see it. Yeah. It needs your money. Go see it and enjoy it. And, yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen it yet, you probably ought to wait to listen to the show until after you've seen it because we're going to kind of ruin it. And there's some some worthwhile, ruinable stuff that we will definitely be talking about. So, so yeah. Now you've been warned. Moving on. How did Spider-Man do in the box office? You just said that it needs your money. Does that mean it didn't do as well as they expected? Well, it's got the record for biggest Tuesday at the box office. And... I mean, you you and I, especially you, will mock these records. You know, it's like, it's the number two animated comedy based on a Japanese television series in the country. And you're just like, yeah, okay. It's not the kind of record that you need to write your mom about. Yeah, the biggest two. I mean, how many movies even open on Tuesdays ever? Tuesdays are always the, like tail end of an opening weekend so of course it's got the biggest tuesday because it opened early on a tuesday (laughs) yes that was the point i was trying to make is that uh, these records mean so little but but it's marvel's own fault if every movie they put out wasn't like the biggest blockbuster we have ever seen then we wouldn't have to keep sliding the rule or making the uh to what do you call the 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 chart with the ups and downs. The bell curve? We have to expand that every single time. Yeah. <laughs> the bell curve keeps widening out because there's that guy, which apparently I had a teacher once in high school. You know, they talked about like the, you know, when we, we called people nerds or, you know, the smart guys and you, you'd call them Point Dexter or whatever. But uh, apparently in his day, when he was younger, they called them the curve buster because they were those the dang ones that <laughs> pulled the curve farther out. <laughs> They're the one that got a 99 on the test while everybody else got like, you know, a 76. Right. And <laughs> so, funny. you know, a 76 could have been a good grade if, if he'd not pulled the curve way out there. So, yeah, Endgame is definitely a curve buster. 
It is. And yeah, the it so it got an a uh, hundred and eighty-five million dollar opening, which sounds awesome. Except for it was a six day opening. Right. On Box Office Mojo it says Sony's Spider Man Far From Home delivered the largest six day opening ever for a Tuesday <laughs> release. And you're just like if the sentence has to be that long, then it's not as big a hit as whatever the hit was before this. It, it, it did fine. It's crossed $200 million, and I, I think it will continue throughout the summer because it's one of those movies that I feel benefits from seeing it again, from watching like the little clues and stuff. And we'll talk more about that later when we start talking about the story. But yeah, it, it's, it's done fine. It's just okay. compared to Endgame, which is the, you know, all-time biggest opening. No asterisk, no dot, 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 no on a Thursday yeah. or anything like that. No, uh, four or six-day opening. It was just the biggest. Yeah. But yeah, I, that's unfair to try and compare it to Endgame. And yeah, it was the same company that did it, but nobody expected Spider-Man Far From Home to give it a run for its money, especially not a few months after it came out. People, they can't get that worked up twice in a row, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, the, I wonder if it was a mistake to have Captain Marvel, Avengers, and Spider-Man come out in such a small space of time. Yeah, Spider-Man they could have waited a few months for. If Avengers came out at the beginning of summer and Spider-Man came out at the end of summer or something came out in November, would they have done better? Yeah, Spider-Man might have done better if they made you wait until uh, November or something like that for it. it. That can be an issue. I don't know. Uh, I, I think it helped Captain Marvel to be you know, hot on the heels of... Uh, Endgame, because everybody's just like, they wanted Endgame so much that they were willing to take anything that was related. You know, it didn't matter what it was. Captain Marvel, we've never heard of it, but okay. If it's Marvel, I'm going. So, I, yeah, I think there was that that really had it going for it. But Spider-Man, yeah, may have, may have suffered from being too soon. Although, I don't know. I think it is going to be fine. Because the thing about this Spider-Man movie is it's a good movie. It's got no drawbacks, and that doesn't always mean success, unfortunately. You know, just because your movie's good doesn't mean it's going to pan out in the end. Uh, But that is a good indicator of success. When your movie is good, it'll probably pan out, and if your movie's bad, it probably won't pan out, unless it's a Transformers movie. Well, and the other thing that it has going for it is that this movie was cheaper than the last movie, than Spider-Man Homecoming. Oh, interesting. Uh, even though it had a gargantuan amount of special effects, and I didn't feel like Homecoming did, why do you suppose this movie was 11 or $12 million cheaper than its predecessor? Well, my guess is because they left New York and weren't having to pay all the money that it takes to film in New York. Instead, they were... In Europe, where they're like, oh, yes, please, come film in this rundown old <laughs> hotel. Please, please. I did notice a bunch of, like, tax credit thanks in the credits at the end, where it's like, thank you to the Italy tax incentive. Uh, but no, that's not why it was cheaper. Uh, oh, I guess because Tony Stark is dead. There so you go. he didn't make an appearance. That's what it was, actually, yeah. <laughs> Instead, there's just paintings of him on the wall here and there and everywhere. But yeah, I thought that was a, an interesting, a really cool thing that we got out of this movie. And we start out, they didn't shy away from the weirdness of the blip. <laughs> yeah, I wish they didn't call it blip that way. I, I guess we called it the snappening or the snap and all that stuff. It wasn't actually called that in the... The movies, but we needed a name for it when we were discussing it endlessly. And so they call it the blip. But I love how it starts out explaining for my mom who didn't see Avengers or explaining for people like us who have wondered. I remember you and I talking about Peter going back to school and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. So is he still in the same grade? 
I mean, like, who are all these people that he's going to school with? Are half of them five years older than the other half? And you asked that question, I remember. Yeah. I remember you saying, did his fat friend also get killed by Thanos? And this explained it. Yeah, the answer was everybody <laughs> that he knew also got killed by Thanos. Yeah, th th that was kind of uh, super handy. They did have one guy in the film that was a little kid or whatever when, when they got snapped away and now he was like studly and, and tall and buffed and Peter was super jealous of him because he thought he wanted to get with uh, MJ. Yeah, I think my favorite part was when they showed the uh, band playing the, well, maybe it wasn't my favorite part, but a part I really liked was when they had the band playing in the gym and then they all turned to dust or, you know, half of them turned to dust. And then they cut to five years later and there's a basketball game going on in the gym and suddenly the band reappears and they all run into them. I thought that was pretty funny and pretty interesting. And I wonder, you know, that's a pretty simple thing to happen. Not very dangerous, but how many people were like driving their cars? Dead, all dead. When the snap happened. How many people were in airplanes or on trains or in elevators? And they rescued them just for them to like suddenly drop onto the freeway and get run over or fall out of the sky from the airplane, etc. All those people were rescued just to die again. But that had to have happened. Of course, they didn't, they didn't go into that, but... Uh... Well, that had to have happened except for that it's magic. And maybe through magic, anybody who, you know, was in an airplane and then disappeared, reappeared, I don't know, on the ground, <laughs> in the ocean, under where the yeah. airplane would have been. <laughs> they still die. Reappeared in the middle of nowhere, um in the flyover country, like just lost in the woods somewhere where their plane had been passing over and then died of exposure. It's like, well, luckily they had their cell phones with them and the cell phones still had charges. But after five years, those numbers no longer worked. So they still died. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but yeah, that's one thing that I really liked about it is that they dealt with that, you know, they didn't ignore it. They didn't just move on and pretend like, hey, everything is just fine. No big whoop. That was cool. Uh, you know, I think we talked about it in one of our shows, you know, just the, we get these great big events and crazy things happen. And, and, but with Marvel, they keep going, you know what I mean? We've got this cinematic universe that continues on and you know spider-man comes after endgame in the same universe and what's the the next one is black widow black widow uh who knows where that's going to take place so i was going to say that kind of happens after but maybe it doesn't and the eternals or whatever is what comes after that right apparently yeah and who knows where the freak or what the freak that is so shoot that kind of blows my my point but up until now, at least, the movies are in the same universe and they happen after the next thing, but each time something crazy happens. You know, how much do they actually deal with that stuff? Sometimes they just gloss over the fact that crazy stuff happened. Other times, you know, you had Iron Man 3 where Iron Man was having all sorts of uh, PTSD issues from, you know, what he'd done to, to save the world and flying through the wormhole and to space and throwing a nuclear missile at the Chitari ship and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it, in this case, they did that. And we, we talked about how we look forward to seeing what those Disney Plus shows are going to do as far as giving us that in-between of the big events. And uh, hopefully, yeah, we get something, uh, something good. Uh, from that, but yeah, that w that was one of the best things about this movie is that yeah, they totally dealt with that kind of stuff and didn't just gloss over it and move on. Although they did kind of. Well, but except for where it's important, which is with Peter Parker dealing with his loss and with his 
I am aven- an Avenger now, but what, where, where do I belong? Yeah. And that was really, I, I really enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed the, I, yeah, okay, it was a huge, huge story. A uh, much, much bigger story than the, than Homecoming was. As far as, you know, the stakes. In the same way that every sequel has to raise the stakes. But it was also a personal story. And I felt like it was satisfying because of that. They never lost track of that it's, that, you know, we, we know how Peter feels about all this stuff. That his inner tor- turmoil about whether he's going to get the girl or get to do what he wants to do is as important to him as whether people's lives are saved, whether the world is coming to an end or not. Yeah, how much Peter kept wanting to just get away from being Spider-Man and he insisted on not bringing any of his suits with him. And Aunt May, of course, snuck it into his suitcase on him anyways. But how much he kept trying to avoid... Nick Fury, he ghosted Nick Fury, wouldn't take his calls. Yeah, just wanted to be a kid for a while. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, we talked about this two years ago when Homecoming came out, of just how remarkable it was that Peter feels like a kid. Like sometimes when he would speak, I'd be like, holy cow, has his voice even broken yet? (laughs) And he's so small, like, you know, Zendaya is not a tall person at all, but she's taller than him. And that helps reinforce the idea that he is a teenager, that he is actually 16 years old, and he's just so earnest. Unfortunately, they're going to have to recast him in the sequels because uh, he's never going to grow. He's going to be like Michael J. Fox, (laughs) still 5'2". But there is a uh, an advantage to that, to someone who looks so young and can pass for a teenager even though he isn't. I guess they're going to do three of these things, and each one is the next year of high school. It's cool that I think we will still buy that he's a high school student by the next one. And uh, boy, the kid is, is likable and dorky and... I remember people complaining about Tobey Maguire crying again and again in Spider-Man in 2002 Spider-Man. You remember people saying, what a wuss. I feel like Peter in this movie cries as much as Tobey Maguire did in the first Spider-Man. He's just a, just a decent kid with the weight of the world on his shoulders, but he doesn't know whether that's what he wants to do or not, and uh, I totally bought that. It wasn't Andrew Garfield, where you're like, dude, you're like 27, and you're like a a model, right? You never went to high school. (laughs) You had personal tutors. But, you know, we've already gotten more movies out of Tom Holland than we did out of Tobey Maguire. Yeah, out of anyone that's been Spider-Man. And that is amazing. This is the idea that they're making these every year. Or a, making a movie with him every year is so smart. And he seems okay about it. The actor seems okay about it. A lot of these actors... Oh, just remember... Uh, what's his name? Daniel Craig said that he... Something about passing broken glass is something like that he would rather self-circumcise with a broken bottle than play james bond again and that was like two movies ago and you're just like wow you know so many actors can't even get a line in a movie and you're just yeah that's the thing that a lot of those actors become that person once they're done and they're like oh shit what did i give up I actually had this thing and I thought I was too good for it and I wanted to be a serious actor and do important things. Next thing you know, they're doing nothing and they're like, oh, please, please cast me as James Bond again. I'll come back. I'll do it for cheap. 
You know, there's so many people that are too good for their thing, and then one day they realize, oh, geez, that thing was all I was. Like, we were talking about uh, Leonard Nimoy and how much he hated being Spock. And he wished that, you know, people would leave him alone and stuff like that. And he wrote his book, I Am Not Spock. It took him a long time to finally come to terms with, no, I am Spock. And he did another book called I Am Spock. And he uh, finally had to realize that if it weren't for Spock, he would be forgotten. He would be long gone. Oh, that's another thing we were talking about was Alec Guinness and how much he kind of hated being Obi-Wan Kenobi. He thought it was silly and stupid. But yeah, nobody would remember Alec Guinness for anything by now. He lives on solely because of that role. And I'm sure he was paid handsomely for it as well, which uh, has got to be a, a good part of that. And I love it when you get an actor like Tom Holland or Hugh Jackman, who was just like, no, I'm, I'm this character for as long as you guys will continue to pay me to be him. I love it. I'll do it for as many chances as you'll give me. Mark Hamill's that way. Yeah. Mark Hamill is the biggest proselyter for Star Wars, for Luke Skywalker. You know, all these years later, he's still, yeah, yeah, I played Luke Skywalker. What, what do you want me to sign it to? You know, that kind of thing. It's just, <laughs> oh, what a nice guy. I don't know. I, 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 I understand in the same way that I can understand, like, a really pretty girl just being sick of guys like opening the door for her, of going into a bar and people buying her a drink. She's like, oh, she's sick of the attention. I, I can sort of understand that, but I can understand the day that nobody buys her a drink, that she's not pretty anymore and people don't even notice more. I can understand that. And that day is going to come. Yeah. So I can only sympathize with these people that just hate every minute of their fame so much. Right. Yeah, it seems like it's wiser to take advantage of it. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear that Tom Holland is one of those guys. Now, he's only signed for six movies, right? His next Spider-Man movie is the last guaranteed one that we've got. Am I right? Oh, I, I don't know. I didn't even know he was signed for three I had been told that this was the last movie in Sony's deal with Marvel, uh -huh. but apparently that's not the case. They, they had a deal where if the movie didn't do X number of dollars, then the rights would revert back to Sony, but it, it will make that money. Always has. So yeah, it, I, there's at least one more. And the guy, uh, John Watts, is that the director? that directed these two is directing the third one. And he said, you know, we start on that as soon as the press tour is done for far from home. <laughs> but he's like that too. He's just like, I am thrilled. I'm a huge Spider-Man fan. I'm so happy that I get to do another one. And, and gosh, I just, I love hearing stuff like that. That's how it should be. Yeah. It seems to me that's one of the best things that Marvel has done is find people who, actually care about the characters, actually care about Marvel, rather than, oh, this person is a great director, and so we need to have that guy. They've had, instead, their fair share of people who just, you know, they love this kind of a thing, and they would do this kind of a thing for free if they could, but all the better that they get paid a shit ton of money. As opposed to, I don't know, DC or some of the others, uh, Fox's X-Men movies and stuff like that where people oh I'm slumming it in the comic book movies for now but soon enough I'm going to hit the big time and do Broadway <laughs> it's, it's, it's so far outside the realm of our experience for us if somebody you, you, you and I used to talk about somebody says hey come and do a radio show with us and just do the same thing that you do on your podcasts. And we're just like, oh, wow, really? Okay, yeah, that'd be great. But then it becomes a job. And any job you resent, any job where you have to go to it, any job where it's like, oh, shoot, I was doing something, but I have to stop doing that 
so I can get to work is drag, man. And I think we would resent that, but I don't know. You've heard it said that if you do what you love for a living, then you will never work a day in your life. And I don't know if that's, you know, bumper sticker logic or if that's true, but again, it beats doing a job that you hate. It beats yeah. doing something where it's like the only, it's the only thing I could get. It beats the thing where you walk home or walk to the subway or whatever after work and your back is just bent with despair, with sadness, with pain. Yeah. I, I remember Harrison Ford complained about playing Indiana Jones, tore up his knees and hurt his back. And, oh, geez, like... If I hadn't done these Indiana Jones movies, I'd be able to sleep in any position at night and not have any pain. And they're like, oh, well, that, you know, that's, that's too bad. And he's like, oh, no, I, don't get me wrong. I can't wait to do another one. And, you know, he's like, I'll be doing these Indiana Jones movies till they won't have me anymore, till I can't lift my arm to crack the whip. So... I think he understands. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there is plenty of doctors that could help him out with that whole... Teach him some, some yoga uh, instructors that could help him get his mobility back so that he could keep going, probably. But yeah, I think that th it just depends. You know, I've worked at three different TV stations, and I did the same thing in all of them, but sometimes... It was a joy. Other times, it sucked. So I think who you work with and what you're doing uh, can make a big difference too. Sometimes it doesn't matter how great the movie is if you have if you absolutely hate the guts of all the people that you're in the movie with. So there is that. I, I found that as far as jobs go, that's one of the biggest things. Is if the people that you work with are a lot of fun to work with then any job can be fun. I've, I don't know if I've said it on the podcast, but I'm sure I've told you a thousand times one of my favorite jobs ever was being the night stalker at the grocery store because, yeah, we would work as a group of guys and I, every one of those guys I liked talking to and hanging out with and we had a lot of fun stocking the shelves. So, you know, it can depend. But we're way off topic here. Let's get back to Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, do you want to just talk through uh, what the movie is about, what happens in the movie, and I'll stop you every once in a while to say, oh, what about this? Okay, I won't get into too much detail, but yeah, we, we talked a little bit about what happens at the start. They talk about the blip and uh, the weirdness that's going on because of that, and uh, their, is it their academic decathlon, or what was their team that they went to Washington with uh, in the first movie? Oh, I, I, I don't know. Debate society? Some, some. They said that this was supposed to be a science tour of Europe. Yeah, okay, so it's the science club, we'll say, which includes all the same people that were in the debate team uh, that wore those little jackets. Weren't they the yellow jackets that they wore in the last movie? But they are all going on a tour of Europe. And while in Europe, at the very first place that they go to... In Venice, it just so happens that some supernatural event, some paranormal event happens. A water monster that I would have called Hydro Man, but I don't know if that really counts as Hydro Man, uh, appears and suddenly Mysterio comes flying in and fights this water monster shooting green lasers at it or something like that. And eventually the water monster goes away, although Spider-Man tries to help because he happens to be there. I don't know that he helped a whole lot. If I remember right, he's inside a church tower or something like that. He keeps hitting his head on the bell. He gets some people to safety, and that, that's what the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man does. It's... Right. He tries to keep the tower from collapsing, but it winds up collapsing in the end anyways. He like tries to web it back in place. But it is unsuccessful as far as that goes. But then Nick Fury shows up, who he has been ghosting. I guess Nick Fury's been trying to call him all along. And Nick Fury brings him in on this whole thing that's going on. And actually, this is uh, the pre-opening title sequence was 
Maria Hill and Nick Fury going to Mexico to a place where one of these events had happened and they show up there just as Mysterio's fighting uh, a dust monster, something like that. Can't remember what that one was. They, th they said the cloud had a face, if I remember right, at that point. Think, yeah, Cyclone had a face, I think he said. And Mysterio says, you guys get out of here. You don't want any part of this. But obviously by the time Spider-Man is in Venice, Mysterio and Nick Fury have teamed up and they're fighting this menace, which Mysterio claims he has come from a parallel universe. And this is the first time we ever hear in, in our MCU the use of the Earth 616, uh, which I thought was interesting. And Mysterio claims to be from Earth some other number. I don't remember what his number was. But yeah, I thought this was very interesting, the, the Mysterio thing, because, you know, I don't know how many people go went to see this and had no clue and were completely surprised by Mysterio's eventual turn. But yeah, I kept watching, and in, in all the promos and all that stuff for the movie too, Mysterio basically seems like he's a good guy. And I kept wondering, are they going to pull something with Mysterio? Like they did with the Skrulls, for example. Skrulls have always been bad guys, but in Captain Marvel, they just said, no, 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 they're just the hunted minority, and they're, they're actually good guys, and they just want to be left alone. And I wondered all along, are they, are they doing something like that with Mysterio? Is he going to come across as a good guy instead of a bad guy by the end of this? But no, he did not. Later, they go to Prague, and in Prague, they destroy Molten Man, who I suppose wasn't really Molten Man. Oh, I guess, yeah, obviously nothing was anything because it was all... <laughs> We find out in the end, they destroy Molten Man, and then uh, Peter decides that Mysterio is a better person to give this... He got these glasses from Tony Stark as like a... You know, was bequeathed to him in his death. He gives him these glasses that link him to a computer system called Edith which uh, stands for even in death i'm the hero or no maybe it was even dead i'm the hero that that way it, it actually works to spell edith but uh and that is all mysterio was after was those glasses and he and peter decides that mysterio is the one that should have them because peter is he's refusing the call to adventure there <laughs> turning down the glasses which turns out to be the big mistake and that was all that Mysterio was after and all along this was just one big uh, illusion that he'd been putting on which is what Mysterio is known for that's his superpower if it can be called a superpower is faking people out illusion and uh, yeah, a, a tiny bit later, we discover that, yeah, Spider-Man has been had. That this thing that MJ has grabbed from the scene of the Molten Man attack is, it's a uh, projector that projects, whatchamacallit? <laughs> holograms? Holograms, that's the word I was trying to come up with. Projects holograms, and Peter realizes he has blown it. And then... He has to fix his problem. So yeah, Mysterio turns out to be a bad guy after all. He's not scrollified in, in this show, which I was glad to see. Because I don't know why, but that's one of those things that still bothers me about Captain Marvel. The scrolls are bad guys. They need to be bad guys. And they're not bad guys yet. Uh, I'm hoping that when we get a Captain Marvel 2... Uh, we find out that somehow the scrolls are bad guys or I don't know. I just, it makes me sad to see good scrolls. Everything makes you sad, dude. <laughs> Holy smoke. Um, but you, you can fix that. You can fix the scroll thing and, and, and use it in the exact same way on Carol Danvers that Mysterio works on Peter in this of having her instantly trust these scrolls only to, to reveal that not all Skrulls are good. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not outside the realm of possibility that we will meet a whole new batch of Skrulls that are 
the kind that we we've come to know in the comics if they choose to go that way and, and i don't know really what they're going to do with her i i would enjoy like a uh what was the series called where several prominent characters from the marvel universe had been replaced by scrolls and uh yeah, it was called Secret Invasion. That would work really well as like a Disney Plus mini series. Yeah. If you could somehow somehow have that be a through line through several Marvel movies, that would be fun. Yeah, you could just get that. I mean, this is jumping way ahead and I don't I I, I want to talk about it possibly more in depth since we're talking scrolls. I'm going to bring it up now. The post credit scene at the end of this, we see that Nick Fury wasn't Nick Fury at all. This whole time he was actually Talos the Skrull from Captain Marvel that had taken his place. And Maria Hill was also a Skrull, a Skrull female, and I don't know if we ever heard her name. She had a name. She was his wife in the Captain Marvel movie, but I, I can't oh, remember okay. the name. From the end. And they were actually uh, playing them for some reason. Which, yeah, they leave you really confused. It doesn't make a lot of sense. They get on the phone or whatever and they call Nick Fury. And Nick Fury is sitting on a beach. But no, he's not sitting on a beach. That's just a uh, projection on the wall to make him feel like he's sitting on a beach and relaxing, I guess. He gets up and he's actually in some giant spaceship full of scrolls. And yeah, at first I thought, oh, this is a intro into Secret Invasion. Uh, Nick Fury isn't Nick Fury. But then they talk to the real Nick Fury and he's hanging out and happy as a clam with all the other scrolls. So I don't know what the hell that was. That, that left me rather confused. Well, it, it is confusing, but it feels like it's intentionally there to set something up. Yeah. And whether that's a Captain Marvel sequel or something else, or, I mean, they've been talking about doing a Nick Fury movie for years, too. I, and I, boy, do it before Sam Jackson doesn't want to do it anymore. Yeah, before he's too old to do stunts and stuff. Before he's too old to even pretend like he's running. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, they could really easily do a Secret War thing where, yeah, post credit scene or just a throwaway scene, you see somebody is actually a scroll. That's what I was thinking that we had here, where it's like, oh, crap, no, Fury is just a scroll. Oh, no. But yeah, then it, it wasn't what we thought it was. So, I don't know, I guess we shall see. But yeah, that is one of my favorite Marvel events, is the Secret Evasion. And they've done it in several ways. They did it on the Avengers cartoon, and I thought they did a really good job with it then, too, where a scroll became Captain America, and then the real Captain America came back to fight him and, and beat him off, and they got rid of the scrolls. But while a scroll was pretending to be Captain America, he said stuff on national TV, so and nobody knew that Captain America was, you know, replaced by somebody else. Then Captain America had to live down what his scroll self had said. And everybody kind of hated Captain America for a long time after that. And I thought that was really interesting. And that, that could be a really... Uh, obviously, that it wouldn't happen to Captain America because he's gone. But, you know, something like that happening. Which I guess is kind of what did happen in this movie. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that for later because that's the other post credit scene. <laughs> The mid credit scene, I guess. Yeah, I think you and I could do a whole episode about the mid credit scene. Because it, except for maybe the reveal of Thanos at the credits of Avengers, it, this one just opens up so many doors. I guess it's a cliffhanger. Yeah. Which we don't tend to get in these movies. But anyhow, yeah, we, we'll deal with that. Later. Yeah, we'll save that for the end of the show. Okay. But going back, yeah, turns out Mysterio's a bad guy after all, and now he has Edith, so he has control over all this stuff that Tony Stark put in place and trusted to Peter's hands to help take care of the world, 
He basically put his trust in this 16-year-old Peter Parker kid because he thought that he was the right kid to trust with this kind of stuff. And yeah, it didn't go over so well because Peter's a, a little bit naive. But Peter did manage to get in close with MJ at this point in the movie, finally. MJ, it's weird that the, she's called MJ. Isn't her name like Michelle Johnson or something like that? Yeah, it was Michelle in the first movie. I, I don't know what the last name is, but... And then they, she says, call me MJ, everybody does, or something like that. Which obviously makes us think, oh, she's supposed to be his love interest, and, you know, that's going to go somewhere. Which is, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> she's not from the comics in any way, is she? I mean, you would know better by a long ways than I would. Not as far as I know. It, uh, she's essentially the... Marvel Cinematic Universe, Mary Jane Watson, in the same way that the character in Dark Knight Rises was the Nolan verse Robin. <laughs> right. And I felt like it was as heavy handed as that in the first movie. But this one, this one certainly pays off in this movie because she's a much more developed character and she is indeed the love interest. And uh, I've, I found her to be a much more likable character in this movie, too. Yeah. She wasn't just the snarky person that made fun of him. I mean, that, that, that's what happens when you give people a lot more to do. I even, and I, this is again for the end of the conversation, but I even felt something for Flash Thompson in this movie. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that's what happens, you know, when we are familiar with characters and they are given business. And, and all of them are, almost all, are given business in this movie, which I thought was fun, you know. Aunt May has... A subplot, which I don't know if it's going anywhere, but his buddy Ned gets a subplot with him and Betty Brant becoming boyfriend and girlfriend. And I wanted to talk to you about that aspect. I wish we had seen the movie together so that afterward I could say, does that ring true to your experience of like, you know, <laughs> teenage romance? Because you did remember people going on like a band trip and suddenly they're a thing. Somebody goes on a ride at the local amusement park together, and now they're dating. It's it felt close to real to me, but I had to ask. I I I, get, I need a judge's ruling from you. Yeah, that kind of stuff happened a fair amount. It's just like you you do something impulsive and kiss somebody, but once you've kissed, well, that means you're going out. You know, yeah, that has to be serious. And I remember one time when I was a young man, I kissed a girl and assumed that, yeah, okay, now it's time. We're going to be going out and this is going to be a thing. And she's like, oh, no, no, I just wanted to make out with you. I'm not, I don't want to go out with you. That's <laughs> it's just a fun thing for tonight. What? Oh, geez. And, and she was a little older than me. So there's, you know, another reason as to why. She's just like... Yeah, maybe when you grow up a little bit, we'll consider it or something. I don't know, but I was surprised. So that, w that was a thing that does happen. Yeah, and I thought it was funny when they get to the end of the trip, and they're like, oh, no, yeah, we're done. Yeah, we, we decided we've grown apart, or I can't remember what they said, but uh, their fling was good for all of the space of the trip, and then that was it, and it was over. And that is also a thing that rings true to my experience from youthful romances. Go out with somebody for a week and then it's over. Funny how that can happen. Okay. Well, the, the movie works as two different things. I mean, it works as a big budget superhero movie. And then it also works as a teen comedy. A teen, uh, what would you call it? Like, you know, like some high school European vacation movie or whatever uh, with, you know, various <laughs> characters. And, and hijinks, that's the word that I was looking for. But hijinks seems frivolous to say. And I, and I guess all that <laughs> stuff is frivolous once you're old like you. Yeah, I'm the only one that's old here. But it means everything when you're that age. And that's something that they really tried to balance in this movie is... 
And Peter didn't know where he wanted to be. And Nick Fury just was having nothing to do with that. He, he could not be less sympathetic to that. You know, of, you need to step up. You got gifts, Parker. You know what I mean? It's like, you need to decide, you know, if you're some yeah, kid. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Just how much of a hard time Nick Fury gave him and how completely non-understanding he was. It made Nick Fury a less sympathetic character than, I mean, obviously than he was in Captain Marvel where he was, you know, young and kind of goofy. And I almost kind of didn't like Nick Fury because he gave Peter such a hard time. I was like, dude, come on, the kid's friggin' 16. Step off, man. And I felt vindicated when I found out that was actually Skrull Nick Fury. Nick Fury probably would have, the real one, would have handled it with a little more uh, finesse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought about that. See, I got to see the movie a second time. And seeing it a second time, knowing he's a Skrull from the very beginning, and knowing that Mysterio, that it's all illusory and that it's all a plot to essentially get revenge on Tony Stark. There are some little clues here and there and things like that. And, you know, so if somebody was just like Nick Fury, the most paranoid man on earth would not fall for this, this, this hero with all these powers from another earth. And, and you know what I mean? I think they covered them, their bases with that, that it's not Nick Fury. Yeah. I thought it was really funny at the end when uh, Talos actually reveals himself and he's just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I fell. How could I, a shapeshifter, have fallen for an illusion like that? The character of Mysterio, uh, when depicted as a good guy, I felt was genuinely likable. Yeah. In a way that Nick Fury was not. Now, I didn't feel like he was unlikable like, say, a certain purple-haired character in The Last Jedi. But he was a hard-ass. Right. But I felt like that's every movie except for Captain Marvel that has been Nick Fury's part. Yeah, that's true. You know, he's the guy that has all the answers and has no patience for the people that don't know what's going on. And then, yeah, there's that moment where he says, I used to know everything. And now, five years later, I, you know, I know nothing. That, to me, was just a little bit to help me sympathize with him and say, yeah, okay, I, I can understand that. Now you're just a guy, aren't you? And how does that feel? But Mysterio, I, oh gosh, I, Jake Gyllenhaal as Mysterio, I felt was a, a, a totally likable dude. And then uh, when he's revealed to be a bad guy, they, there was still a couple of levels there, I felt like. Where he's just like, you know, now I got to kill Peter Parker. And, you know, I don't want to do that, but I have to. Thanks a lot, guys. What You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, I still kind of liked him all the way to the end. And I don't know if that's because of the way he was written. I don't know if that's because Hall is a likable actor. I, I never really felt anything one way or another. But I just, yeah, I, I, I have no complaints. And the look of Mysterio... Have they ever ported over a character from the comics so perfectly as Mysterio? <laughs> I've heard people say that he looks goofy or that he looks ridiculous. And I never felt that for a second in this movie. And, and it's just because, no, that's what Mysterio has always looked like. If anything, this looks cooler than the Mysterio in my head ever looked. Like the, the thing that they did with the fishbowl on his head constantly having like green moving gases and stuff in it is just awesome yeah i loved the way that that looked and, and it makes me always ask you know if you can make mysterio who again wears purple and green and has a fishbowl on his head look this awesome then the excuse of you know no one would buy that cannot fly yeah yeah, they could make uh, Dr. Octopus wear green and be, like, short and fat and have that bowl cut and the, the glasses. They could make the rhino be the actual rhino instead of that stupid thing they came up with in Amazing Spider-Man 2, right? It was 2 that they did that? It was two, It was 4 seconds in 2. Yeah, where he had the stupid robot suit or whatever. Could do all sorts of fun stuff. 
Uh, what did you think of Mysterio? Had you were you familiar with him from the comics? And uh, uh, I'm I'm only vaguely familiar with him. I knew you know that he his powers are kind of based on illusion and you know magic tricks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, I knew what he looked like, <laughs> but I'm not really familiar with Mysterio very much. I don't think I've even seen a cartoon with him in it. Okay. Um, I mean, but I didn't know that he was a bad guy. So, like I said before, I was sitting there going, no, this guy's a bad guy. This can't be happening. And yeah, like you were saying, he was super likable. L like one of my favorite things was when uh, Peter calls him Mysterio. And he's like, who's Mysterio? I, I think it was Nick Fury says that. And he's like, oh, that's just what the uh, kids... In my class called him. And then the next time he sees him, he says, Mr. Beck or whatever. And he says, no, I'm Mysterio. I thought that was really cool, the way that they pulled that. I was almost as good as when Ned calls Peter's stealth suit Night Bunky. <laughs> and then <laughs> the next thing you see is on the news on the super it says night monkey battles monster or whatever <laughs> it said it in uh in some other language right i'm trying to remember it says mysterio a night monkey contra yeah, was... you know it's like and uh, i just oh that's so cool oh uh, yeah For, i don't know why but i loved the name night monkey and when like some woman in Germany or something goes, hey, Night Monkey or whatever. Oh my gosh, dude. Just the, the coolest Yeah. Thing. They need to make a Night <laughs> Monkey solo movie where somebody wearing the Night Monkey suit saves the day in Europe. Well, what happened to that suit? Yeah, it's, it's out there somewhere. It should be like, you know, when Spider-Man just puts his suit in the garbage can and I am Spider-Man no more. You know, he leaves the monk night monkey suit behind and then somebody else comes out and finds it. <gasps> I am night monkey. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of things that I didn't like about this movie and they're, they're few and far between. Yeah, I thought they did a really good job. It's so well done that the second time through I liked it more. Oh, nice. And I noticed the business that all these characters got here and there. I mean, mostly the kids all get stuff, but like something that they never managed to achieve in any media except for the comic books and probably the 1960s Spider-Man, Spider-Man show was how much of a dick Flash Thompson is to Peter Parker, but how much he idolizes Spider-Man and I just, oh gosh, I, 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 I was not thrilled with this choice for Flash Thompson in the first movie. But now here we are two years later and I'm used to it. I just, I enjoyed everything that Flash did in this movie. And I think that that can be said with a lot of the characters. I remembered thinking that Happy Hogan was a, another hard ass in the last movie. It's just like, why is he such a dick, dude? And then in this movie, that's completely gone. And he even gets an action sequence, with, which I don't remember him ever getting in any movie up till now. In Iron Man 2, he fights a guy while Black Widow dispatches the entire rest of the gang. And then he turns around. That's true. <laughs> he takes down a guy and Black Widow takes down like 10 guys. Yeah, and then he turns around and like ready to help her fight some more. And they're all completely blasted and he's like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> he still helped the, the the like the hijinks with his teacher who is so well-meaning but like so dumb and backward and dorky i found charming i shouldn't have I, because you see that in movies at, or commercials or whatever where there's the parental figure that's so clueless and so dumb just so that the kids can seem smart. And I've seen that so many times, but yet I still found it charming in this movie. Yeah, it didn't bug me. That can be annoying, you know, the 
the Disney Channel kind of a thing where they're so worthless, but the good thing about it is that they're in Europe or whatever. So, you know, they're gonna be fish out of water no matter what. I, I liked the difference between the two of the two teachers that were with them too, you know? You had the one teacher who wanted to be the guy in charge, but didn't really have what it took to be that guy. And then there's the other one who's just like, no, F this, I don't, I don't care. Don't you bring me into this. <laughs> I'm taking an Ambien. <laughs> yeah. The second teacher that just, you know, did not give a crap at all. I like that they gave us the two different kinds. They managed to make a pretty good high school comedy with this, uh, with like misunderstandings and, uh, you know, kids out to have a good time. And I felt like that stuff worked as well as the action movie stuff. And I wonder if that was difficult, if they worked really, really hard to make both of those halves of the story satisfying if it was just luck or if, you know, the, the screenwriters are that talented. I, I don't know because we've seen movies where they do that st kind of stuff. In fact, on The Flash television show, which both of us are big fans of, they try and do that. They try and have the interpersonal low-key stuff going on in every episode while they have the big overarching battles with colorful supervillains. And there have been times when the low-key stuff just doesn't work. Yeah. You know, you're just like, oh gosh, this is just filler. So that you can justify having a, an all-CG King Shark character in this episode. Yeah, just filler so you can justify having the bug-eyed bandit as your bad guy. How dare you. <laughs> And so, and I didn't feel that in this movie. Just like every time it was the teen hijinks half of the show, they'd play like some local pop song in German or in Italian. And it, I don't know, it totally worked. I would have been fine to see Peter Parker and his friends in Europe without any bad guys his amazing friends well no his the his banal friends <laughs> his completely ordinary friends and so i think that that is laudable too that that i managed to be hooked in that aspect as well if they had had no budget at all and had to make a six million dollar spider-man film they would have totally sold me a ticket Unlike like the Nicholas Hammond 1970s Spider-Man TV show where they couldn't afford to have any supervillains or any wall crawling or any action at all. And so the show is unwatchably boring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it was a really good show. I was impressed with it all around. I really liked some of the illusion stuff. You know, they have the, the part where... Uh, Peter gets hit by a train at the end of the illusion. And then the, the last big battle where he has to go through the illusion somehow and actually get to Mysterio. And he used his Peter tingle to make it happen. And I thought that that was a really impressive sequence and I, I really liked uh, the way that went. And I felt that it made uh, Spider-Man seem like a more awesome character than I think he has uh, in the past at all, too. I, I really like the way that they uh, turned his spider sense into such a, a formidable kind of a valuable asset. You know, they've, they've used it in other movies. Here and there, Spider-Man will suddenly duck. Like when uh, Tobey Maguire's talking with Mary Jane in the little cafe and then suddenly he stops and he jumps and just gets out of the way as Dr. Octopus throws the car through the window of the uh, cafe they're hanging out in. But it's never been such a thing to the point where, yeah, he can totally defeat the master of illusion by just relying on his spidey sense to jump off walls that he can't even see. It almost felt like he, he had turned into Daredevil in that sequence. Yeah, I have no comment to that, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> what else would you like to talk about? Well, I mean, you and I really liked the movie, but let's talk about the coolest 
post credit sequence, or at least since The Avengers. Because, you know, Marvel movies have become known for their, hey, stay in your seat, there's going to be something else. And then after Endgame so disappointed me, and I shouldn't complain because they gave me three hours of solid entertainment. But to not have anything at the end, to, you know, not even say Bucky will return at the end, <laughs> bums me out. This, this gave us just so much. Like I said, we could do an episode about the mid credit sequence and the post credit sequence. So Peter uh, defeats Mysterio, or, and, and Mysterio ends up taking himself out. He's gotten control of all of these weaponized drones they're trying to kill Spider-Man. Uh, he's got a bunch of them behind him that won't fire because they're afraid of hitting him. And he tells them to fire anyway. And sure enough, they fill him full of holes and he dies. And then and, and there's that really neat last twist where he's dying and giving his final words of, uh, you know, it was never personal. Uh, you're a good guy, Peter. And that is also an illusion so that he can shoot Peter in the head. Uh, and the spider sense rev uh, gives that away, saves Peter, and, and then Mysterio dies. That, that's how he went out. And the movie is, is over. You know, they, they all come back to America and resume their lives. And uh, Peter and MJ are now, a th uh, they're going to try to be a thing. It looks like they hold hands coming out of the airport and uh, he takes her swinging, and then the credits roll. And it's a satisfying movie. I dug that. The, and just like, okay, so now we get our end credit sequence. But nobody leaves unless they're idiots. And then when the end credits, sorry, the, the opening credits end, <laughs> what, what do you call it? The contractual opening credits, which are now at the end of every one of these movies, except for the two Guardians of the Galaxies. When that ends... The movie resumes with their web-swinging ending, and she f says, let's never do that again. She's completely freaked out about it. And then there's a news flash on a building. Conveniently, they're able to watch it with a bunch of New Yorkers. And J. Jonah Jameson from the Daily Bugle appears to give us the news... And my, one of my favorite things is that they got J.K. Simmons from the original Spider-Man movies to be J. Jonah Jameson in this. Oh my gosh, I thought that was so great. I don't know if they're planning on bringing him back in the future in any way, but oh, it was so cool. I, I, that was one of my favorite things about those old Spider-Man movies is J. Jonah Jameson was so... So good. He was the he was perfect, perfect casting in those movies for that character. No one could have played him any better. The best that they could have hoped for was to be as good as he was. He was amazing. And yeah, they got him back to be uh, Jameson again. And yeah, he appears with, oh, this just into our office or whatever. The last, you know, the stuff that happened on this bridge. And yeah, Mysterio has sent out a press release. I don't know what he did exactly, but basically he got footage of himself saying that Spider-Man was the one in charge of the drones. It was actually him that did it, and he shows a clip of Spider-Man saying, yes, execute them, which was, you know, Spider-Man telling Edith. He's just like, would you like all the drone safety protocols returned? And he's like, yes, execute them all. Something like that. Yeah. And so he has that clip edited in. And then on top of that, he says, and Spider-Man's real name is Peter Parker. And so not only is Spider-Man blamed for what he just saved the world from, he is also unmasked by this. Uh, and, and it was interesting. I remember at one point uh, as the movie was coming to an end, you see one of the flunkies saving something off to a thumb drive or doing something with like a thumb drive. Yeah. Little Ralphie from uh, Christmas Story has, has saved whatever the next illusion is onto a, a portable drive and then we never see him again. 
Yeah, and I assume that must have been what he was doing, was getting this last little bit set up. So now, uh, here we are. Peter Parker has been unmasked and revealed to the entire world. And not only that, but also called a villain. And yeah, then we just get a shot of Peter Parker going, what the f... And then it cuts. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, and that's the... Well, that's one of my few criticisms with the Marvel Cinematic Universe is from the very beginning, none of these superheroes have secret identities. I am Iron Man. Set the precedent right there. Uh, except for Peter. Peter, they maintained that for a reason. And I really liked that, even though... A hundred people see him in Far From Home without his mask on. He understood, like you and I do, that to protect the people that you love from when you have as many enemies as a hero like him does, you have to hide your identity to protect them more than to protect yourself. Right. And then to have that stripped at the end of the movie and the credits roll is wonderful. It's, it's a way to get us talking for the next two years about what's going to happen and what should happen, what will happen with Aunt May, and who else might be put in danger because of this. And, you know, that, that stuff, it does exactly what they set out to do, which is have us speculate and wonder and go, oh, no, and then the, the credits roll. I, I love that. I can't wait to see the next movie. And I do hope that Jameson comes back yeah. and has a larger part in the next one as far as, you know, not enough is being done to capture this menace. Spider-Man must be brought to justice. You know, that kind of stuff, I eat that up. And I loved the way that, that J.K. Simmons played him. I mean, we lose his connection with Peter Parker in this reboot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas in the comics, when Peter unmasked, and that was during the Civil War storyline, that threw everything into upheaval he lost his job over it. Jameson felt so betrayed by this kid that he felt like he had treated as his own son, even though he had been very mean to Peter over the years. He felt so betrayed and he, you know, he's like, we're going to sue him for every cent we've ever paid him for pictures of Spider-Man and stuff like that. And poor Aunt May, you know, is going to have trouble. And anybody that has any connection with Spider-Man suddenly becomes a target. And, and that's the thing, is anybody who has any connection to Peter Parker becomes a target. Like Ned has crosshairs on his forehead, being Peter's best friend, you know? Yeah. And I wonder about that. It's like Ned has always been really supportive and a cheerful, friendly guy every time we see him. But what happens when now he can't go to school? Yeah. You can't put that genie back in the bottle, can you? like the comics did by just having Doctor Strange say, <laughs> everyone who saw you unmask yourself on national television has forgotten. <laughs> and, you know, a wave of the hand and they've all forgotten. And, dude, I couldn't have fixed it any better than they did in the comics. Doctor Strange is one of the few credible ways that you could fix that. But still, I can't wait to see the third one and see what happens and who do you trust now? You know, where do you go? Luckily, he's an Avenger. So there's always a place he can go with people that are tougher than him to protect the people that he cares about. He'll go to the Avengers and he say, Oh, this is bullshit. I did not do it. I did not hit her. Oh, hi, Bruce. <laughs> and uh, hopefully that'll fix everything. <laughs> that... That is one of those cliffhangers, those, those things that just leave you wondering, wanting to talk. Something that you could talk for a long time about. Maybe Peter will do a deal with the devil. Oh, and, no. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's for those people like me that say that they don't hew close enough to the comic books. <laughs> Suddenly we eat our words and go, oh, no. No, I didn't mean I that. Didn't, no, don't, don't stick close to that comic book. Can pick any other <laughs> we shall see yeah that is one thing that this movie did really well was leave us with something to think about and the weird thing is it, i mean you said that they're starting into the next movie as soon as the press tour ends so that must mean they're already on it 
but oh my gosh, it feels like it's going to be forever before <laughs> we're going to find out about it. Because yeah, I mean, what we got Black Widow and the Eternals. Eternals. And then is it after that? What? How long until we get to the next one? Well, my guess is summer 2021, which seems like a long time, but it's not. Because Sony actually owns Spider-Man. Sony actually made this movie. And they'd be happy to do a Spider-Man movie a year. Right. The only other franchise Sony has is James Bond. Well, uh, Sorry, sorry. Let me rephrase. The only other successful franchise that Sony has is James Bond. And so... They really want to milk this spider thing as much as they can. And uh, have you ever tried to milk a spider? It's dangerous, dude. Yeah. Sometimes you get bitten and the venom is not good. But have you ever drank spider milk, though? Ew. It's really tasty. Yeah. It, I don't. It was like drinking coconut milk to me. It's just like they were too close. Yuck. <laughs> Yeah, I I do look forward to the next round. I'll be thinking about it, and I'm sure we'll talk so much on this show about it from now until then. Good. I'm glad. I I hate that we've gone this long, but let's go longer because, you know what, we can charge more. (laughs) Oh, yes. We can charge up to three times the zero that we charge for this show if we do this long of an episode. But uh, they got Giacchino to come back and do the score, and... Boy, if I had a dollar for every time he played that Spider-Man theme that he came up with for Homecoming, well, you could go see the movie again on my dime. <laughs> and boy, the guy is a talented, a really, I, I just, he's delightful. It is one of those where he, he came up with that theme and then he does endless variations on it. Yeah. It's like, oh, here is the sad version of the theme oh here is the bombastic version and here is the scary version of the theme and it's just like you know that that's cool and we talked about that two years ago which seems like five minutes ago that this was the first time in a marvel movie where they beat us over the head with the theme enough to where you could hum the theme the next day yeah i really dug that that the second you hear that uh, that Giacchino theme at the beginning of the movie. You're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and then they just kept doing it and kept doing it, and I loved that. That was uh, a really good part of the movie. It really stuck out. It really, uh, you, you noticed it. You know, it wasn't one of those themes where you, oh, that was the theme? Oh, yeah, I don't remember hearing that. I, and I remember thinking as I, when I left the theater that I need to get the soundtrack to this one. I can't remember if I got the soundtrack up to the last one, but I want to say that I did, that I liked it enough that I got it. But yeah, this time I definitely want to get it because I really uh, enjoyed it and I want to uh, listen to all the variations of the theme and just check that out because that was great. G- Giacchino. You know, one time I, I saw somewhere where they told you how to pronounce his name, but unfortunately I forgot it. <laughs> well, I have the advantage of being too old to give a crap. I've called yeah. him Giacchino since you introduced me to him, saying there's this guy that did the Incredibles theme, and he is talented. And I was like, oh yeah, I think he did the music for Lost. And you said, what, the one note that plays when Lost comes on the screen? And I was like, yeah, that's talent. But yeah, good stuff, dude. Yeah, he. I think you're the one that calls him the next John Williams. Well, there's nobody else. Yeah, that's true. Uh, he does really feel like he's at least can do it as good as John Williams sometimes. Yeah, the only other guy who I think is comparable is the guy that did the music for Rogue One, where he was trying to sound like John Williams. He was trying to step into John Williams' you know, incredibly large shoes. And uh, I, I can't remember who that guy was, but I think he's almost as good yeah. as Michael Giacchino. He was really good, you're right. I did like that guy a lot. If only I could remember his name. <laughs> That's all right. Somebody let us know in the comments below. I want to say it was some kind of weird Italian name, but I can't think of it. Oh, well, that's why we don't remember. 
Yeah, yeah. It's that's not pronounceable. Be, somebody will let us know in the comments. Um, so. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that. You always mention the music in these movies, and you, and that's usually one of the few criticisms we have for the Marvel movies. But the last two, uh, we've been happy to hear the themes repeated over and over again, and, and that's cool. Yeah, I hope that it is a trend that will continue. Next year we'll be like, oh yeah, that Eternals theme. Oh man, so good. <laughs> if only I knew what the friggin' Eternals were. <laughs> you and I really ought to sit down and just be like, let's, let's do an episode where we let people know who the F the Eternals are. Yeah. Because I don't know. Do an episode where we read the Wikipedia entry for them? <laughs> yes. Okay, you take the next paragraph. That, let's do that. Yeah. And it's a 90-minute episode because every time there's a reference to somebody, we go to that page and say, okay, and this person is... Oh, it's referring to somebody. I've never heard of this guy. Oh, we better look that one up, too. That would be gold. It would be better than our story episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, another thing that I didn't like in the last one, no, it wasn't even the last one. It was Civil War, wasn't it? I just, I didn't like that Marissa Tomei was Aunt May. Oh, right. I didn't like that she's sexy. I didn't like that she's somebody young because there was always the frailty of Aunt May to worry about. There was always the fear that what will happen when May finds out or what will happen if she is put in danger because she was at the point of death. And I, I've heard that spoken as a criticism of the comics is that anytime Stan or any of his, the people that came later wanted, you know, an easy bit of drama, it was just like, well, have Aunt May have a heart attack or have Aunt May be in the hospital or have Aunt May faint. But I loved that. I love that a hell of a lot more than let's have the bad guy capture Mary Jane. Right. Which they did in every one of the Sam Raimi movies. And they would have done it if she had been in any of the other movies. I always liked that. And that was one of the reasons he had a secret identity that no one could know. Was because the shock would kill Aunt May. And you got the fun of May saying that Peter is such a fragile boy. And she would worry about him. Because he, you know, in her mind, was a weakling. <laughs> Right. He had never gotten past the big glasses, nerdy science kid. I love that Aunt May, the grandmotherly, elderly Aunt May. And we saw that with Rosemary Harris in the Raimi movies. And that's another bit of casting from his movies that was just dead on for me. It was perfect. I loved that she was frail and old, but she had a bit of old person wisdom to her. Right. You know, I believe there's a hero in all of us. You know, that kind of stuff. I just, oh, I loved that. And this is a totally different take on Aunt May. But I don't fear for Aunt May's safety or her health or her life. Uh, you just fear for whether Happy Hogan is going to take advantage of her. <laughs> I don't, because she clearly wears the pants in that relationship. It's just a funny version uh, uh, sorry, not a funny. It's it's just a twist on that character. But I don't appreciate it in the same way that I wouldn't appreciate if Lois Lane were hard as nails, a ball breaker, and she gets herself out of every dangerous situation that she gets in because she don't need no man. Yeah. No Superman. And I know there have been Lois Lanes like that, but I don't want any of that bullshit. I want the Lois Lane that's just like, oh boy, uh, how am I going to get Superman? <laughs> Superman, where are you? Kind of thing. I just, that was the charm of that character. And I don't feel like it takes away from her lovability, even in this cynical age, that she, you know, is in danger and, you know, only Superman can save her. Yeah, she had the superpower of being able to get into danger more often than anyone else could. <laughs> But in the same way that we've criticized Captain Marvel, that's one of Superman's weaknesses, is that he loves Lois Lane. And if something were to happen to her, it would destroy him. That makes Superman a better character, not a weaker character. 
You know what I mean? We worry because he worries. Yeah. We like Lois Lane because he likes Lois Lane. I, I don't know why that's so difficult, but, but I guess it is. And, you know, good luck to wh- whoever runs the distinguished competition because they just can't get that right. But, but also they can't get Superman right, and that should be easy. Yeah, so you wish Aunt May was cast as anybody else? No, no, I, I get it. it was one, one of my few criticisms. And we've got a, a third Spider-Man movie coming out, and I'm not going to be terrified that somebody's going to murder this sweet old lady. Right. Because Spider-Man put him in jail. I feel like she can take care of herself. Plus, she's really attractive. And strangers will probably stand up to take care of her if Peter is not there. I, I don't know. There's, there's got to be drawbacks to having a young Aunt May that can make Peter worry. But so far, it's just been, ooh, somebody wants to date my aunt, which to me isn't terrible at all. Nobody has ever said that in their lives because in real life, you'd be like, oh, great. Somebody wants to date my aunt. She's not going to be alone. Yeah, I don't know. It definitely doesn't give you the the Aunt May thing. And I, I still feel that way about Flash. I'm not a fan of the guy they got for Flash. Because Flash is supposed to be the studly dude, you know? He's supposed to be the football star, the jock that everyone looks up to and wants to be. And, you know, he casually, carelessly makes fun of Peter Parker and makes him feel you know, worthless and stupid. And the guy that they got, he's not attractive. I don't know. I mean, I again, I'm, I don't swing that way, but I think I'm a good enough judge to say, yeah, this guy's not... I mean, the dude that didn't get blipped and had grown up and gotten big and strong, that guy was a hundred times more attractive than Flash is. You know, I mean, Flash is still a jerk and stuff, like other stuff too, you know, like they're, they're on a science trip to Europe. Flash Thompson would not be on the science trip, you know. In the last movie, he was on the debate team or whatever they went for that trip for. And he would not be on the debate team. He would be on the football team or the basketball team or the badminton squad. I don't know, but he just doesn't work for me. And, you know, they, they did stuff. That made him kind of likable. You know, he had his annoying thing where he would live stream wherever he was going and talk to the Flash mob, who were supposedly all of his followers out there. How many does he actually have? You have no idea. His Flash mob could be the 30 people that follow his channel. (laughs) But hey, he was dedicated. He really put in the, uh, the hours as far as that goes, but... Yeah, I thought it was interesting at the end of the movie when they get back to the airport. You know, everybody's parents are there waiting for him or whatever, except for Flash's parents. You know, he shows up and and it's just his butler, his chauffeur, Jarvis is waiting for him, whatever. And he's like, oh, where's... I don't even... What did he say? For some reason, I want to say he didn't say where's mom and dad or something. He He said, "Was, was mother not able to come to pick me up? Something like that. And I wondered about that. Like what, it's a scene that should have been cut unless it's going for something, you know what I mean? I guess there was an earlier scene where Peter is looking at everybody's texts and Flash's texts are, Mother, Father, I haven't heard from you in a few days. Uh (laughs) Yeah, I think it's just texture so that we understand that he's a a person, so that we feel a little bit sorry for him. I totally don't believe it's going anywhere. But if you don't think in so, the th- you don't think they're pushing toward an Agent Venom thing in the future or something like that? I would listen. I would bet your life on it, not my own, <laughs> but I would bet the life of B.D. Anklevich on it that it's not going anywhere. That it's just business that they decided to give the character to be funny. But in the third movie. If they decide to follow up on this and, and, you know, he is a surprising ally to Peter or, you know, a surprising enemy to Peter because of this, I will eat my words and be like, oh, wow. But there's no way that Tony Revololi 
is going to be Agent Venom in any movie, in any multiverse, <laughs> including the, the billions of possible alternate universes where they're making Spider-Man spin-off movies. Yeah, I, I probably agree with you there. He's miscast for that as well. But those were the two things that kind of stood out to me in this movie was that one scene where the, what did you call him? Uh, Ralphie from... <laughs> from a Christmas from Story. Christmas Story? Is that the, actually the actor that played him? Yeah, it's Peter Billingsley. Oh, and he was in wow, I... the original Iron Man. Huh. And yeah, he's the guy that says, with all due respect, sir, I'm not Tony Stark. And he says, Tony Stark... <laughs> Built this, this in a cave, cave with a box of scraps. I liked that, by the way, too. The flashbacks to those two characters having been behind the scenes in earlier movies. I, I thought that, that was really neat. Yeah. It gives you an excuse to show Robert Downey Jr. and not pay him any royalties, too. <laughs> or Those were the two scenes that popped out to me. Is that guy grabbing the little flash drive and then walking away and then yeah we never see him again and then yeah the bit with flash and his chauffeur or whatever and i just thought huh that was weird that seems like something that you know would have been on the cutting room floor or wouldn't wouldn't have even made it into the, the final script so yeah the fact that we got that was was interesting but I, two years ago when we were doing the homecoming episode you had that same criticism and you said this guy is way bigger dork than peter parker is what were they thinking casting this guy as flash thompson but it's it's a choice they've made to have him be kind of pathetic in both movies is it just because it's mean and it's funny or do you think they're actually going somewhere with it i have no idea to tell you the truth yeah, I, I remember having that criticism before, and I still feel that way. I still don't like him as Flash, because he's not Flash. You know, Flash is a different character. And it's like you said with a sexy Aunt May, you know. It just doesn't work when every every time anybody comes over to see Peter, they want to bang Aunt May while they're there. Maybe they wanted to get away from the standard bully thing that they that they had with Flash and, and give you a, maybe a different take at it, which is cool, you know? It's, it's better that this is what Flash is like than he be like the bullies in Shazam, who were psychotic, sadistic types of people. Oh yeah, let's beat up somebody with crutches every day. <laughs> yeah, right. It's better that we that we get this flash than we get a flash that's like that. So, you know, I, I prefer at least that. So maybe it's better in the end. Then they handle it even worse. <laughs> I guess there there could be that option. Yeah, well, we, we could do it like you want, but we'll do it way worse. <laughs> um, if some listener finds this flash attractive and would like to see him as Agent Venom, let us know. Yeah. Because it just, yeah, I feel the same way as Big. He is so dorky and gimpy and I feel sorry for him. The guy who played Flash in Spider-Man, the 2002 Spider-Man, he was one of the dudes in Magic Mike that spent the whole movie with his shirt off. <laughs> and it's like, that's what Flash <laughs> should be. He should be the guy exactly. that should be a superhero. And there there are depths to that character. He's not completely two-dimensional in the comics as well, but it's just, I feel like he should be a certain way. And so I'm curious to see where they go with him in this, but it certainly isn't Agent Venom. <laughs> yeah, probably not. All right, I think we've said enough. This is going to have to be at least two, probably three episodes in the end. So we probably better, better wrap it up. And well, thanks everybody for listening. Hope you got some enjoyment out of it. Hopefully uh, we said some things that were worth listening to. <laughs> but thanks for sticking around with us to the end. And we'll be back again soon with some more here on the Dune Steve and on That Gets My Goat. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you later. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield, and I hope you had a good summer.
because it's going to take me that long to edit this episode. <laughs> there we go. All right, folks. See you next time. Bye. See ya. Ah, Soundwave. What have you learned from your reconnaissance? Great Megatron, we have surveyed this area and discovered two things. One, a small mine found to contain enough raw materials to produce 47 Energon cubes. Good, good. And the other? That the That Gets My Goat podcast has been produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 No Derivatives License. What does that mean? That the podcast is free to listen to, download, and share liberally, but it cannot be altered, sold, or made claims upon. I don't understand. One cannot credit the podcast's content as their own, nor can they attempt to sell it or make changes to it. No, no, you fool. What in the name of Unicron is a podcast? Merely more evidence in the inferiority of these flesh-based Earth creatures. Yes, Soundwave, and it will make it all the more satisfying to crush them. Indeed, Lord Megatron, indeed. Just make sure you podcast it when we do. <laughs> Oh, I nearly hung up on you instead of... Uh, instead of hitting stop. And go ahead and explain what happens here. Well, this is one of my favorite things that happened was that uh, J. Jonah Jameson from uh, uh, the... Shoot, I wanted to say Daily Planet. Uh, <laughs> Daily Bugle. Oh, thank you. J. Jonah Jameson from the Daily Bugle appears to give us the news... And my, one of my favorite things is that they got... Oh, shoot, now I can't remember his name. What's the name of the actor? <laughs> J.K. Simmons. <laughs> okay. Uh, JK, they got J.K. Simmons from the, uh, the original Spider-Man movies, saying that Spider-Man was the one in charge of the drones. It was actually him that did it, and he shows a clip of Spider-Man saying, Yes, execute them! Which was, you know, Spider-Man telling... Edith to execute his orders or what was he saying exactly I can't remember <laughs> yes she's just like would you like uh would you like all the drones uh you know or whatever you know to be it's just like I can't remember it I pressed the button you're listening to the Dune Steve audio fiction magazine 